This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha, I'm Rufi Hanneman, and welcome to Think Tech as we debut another show here called Tourism 101. It'll be opportunities to talk to movers and shakers in our community that will share their manao, share their thoughts and comments of where we are today in our tourism industry, as well as the challenges and opportunities that await us in the future. Today, our guest in our very first show is the chairman of the Senate Committee of Tourism, Economic Development, and Technology. Please say hello to and give a warm aloha to Senator Glenn Wakai. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a, such a pleasure to be with you in any type of uh, environment, Goofy. Well, you know, Senator, you've had a, a very varied career, if you will, before you went into public service. Uh, I know everybody first heard about you uh, when you were doing broadcast journalism on the news stations and so forth. Can you talk about uh, some of the aspects of that career and what might have led you to go into public service? Well, I'm a local boy. Uh, grew up in Wanalua. Uh, got a journalism degree from USC. Uh, my first job after graduating was going to Guam and Saipan. And at first I thought, where's Guam? Right? And, and so it was, it was kind of a leap of faith for me to go out there. I spent two years in Guam and two years in Saipan and loved it. I had a wonderful experience there. Um, worked at a CBS affiliate in uh, Guam, then went to Saipan, and they didn't have television news. This is back in 1991 or 92. And so uh, I helped create, with another uh, news director, the TV program that still exists today. And so that, to me, was a, I th thought was a, a wonderful legacy to uh, initiate that uh, communication tool for the people of the Northern Marianas. Then came back to Hawaii, worked uh, for seven years at uh, Channel 2 and what used to be KHNL News 8, which is now Hawaii News Now. But, you know, back in 2002, um, I realized the world was changing, that no one's waiting at 6 to, or 10 o'clock, right? Everyone's getting their news right here, right now, instantaneously, real time. So I saw the writing on the wall that the news business was changing. So it was an opportunity for me to go and do something different. And one thing that is great about the news business is fun, exciting, different every day. One thing bad about the news business is that you're only a spectator. You're always talking about what other people are, are doing. And I wanted to be part of the change of Hawaii. So in 2002, made the jump into the political arena in the state house. Um, and in 2010, made the transition to the state senate. And I've been there uh, since then and now chair the Committee on Economic Development, Tourism, and Technology. Now, uh, I have lots of friends, as you know, in Guam and, and Saipan, and they still talk about you. You left such an impact there. Uh, and of course, uh, now that uh, you're here in Hawaii, uh, the days that you spent uh, being uh, in broadcast journalism, I think, has also uh, enabled you to kind of have instant name recognition with a lot of folks. Tell me a little bit about public service in terms of uh, the sacrifices that, that one makes to go into that uh, career and, and the fact that you've been so successful that you've never lost an election. Uh, uh, knock on wood, yes. <laughs> so far, so good. 16 years in politics, I love it. It's a dream job. I wake up every day thinking, what can I do to help improve the environment? And as I was kind of mentioning briefly earlier about you know, the frustration as a journalist, that you, you see the troubles in society. and I mean, that's kind of what a journalist does, right? It's kind of poke and point to controversy here, screw-ups here. And now, in this capacity, I can watch the news and actually oftentimes respond to things as crime goes this way, education goes that way, house our infrastructure, uh, and have a hand in trying to improve all of those uh, various troubles that we have in, in our society. So I, I, I love public service, and uh, I found my true calling in life. You know, and you're very actively involved in the community. I, I see you uh, at the schools, I see you in the community, uh, and you've done some wonderful things for the high schools in your area. Can you talk about some of those things? I'm a big fan of uh, education because I think the greatest responsibility for any politician is to set the stage for the next generation. And to that end, I've always tried, I have three, three high school complexes in my district, Barrington, Moanalua, and, and Radford. And uh, everything from getting them funding for tracks, gym, performing arts center, to doing just going in and talking to the Japanese students at Moanalua High School or the band students at Farrington High School and, and just talking to them about leadership and how important public service is 
I, I, I try my best to get involved in not just the macro uh, policy making from the state capital, but going into the schools and you know effectuating kids and their lives. And in fact, last this past year, you and I partnered with um, Kalakaua Middle School, Farrington High School, and uh, Kalihi Kai Elementary School for uh, caring for Kalihi, where we brought the kids together uh, to try and see how they could uh, address a problem that is on their front doorstep, which was homelessness. So with your assistance, we gathered uh, school supplies, we gathered clothing, and we gathered toys, which we took to IHS. But you know, just those grassroots efforts, I think, are super important to helping to revitalize our community. I was just going to mention that uh, thank you for helping Kali. That's my hometown, as you know. And uh, uh, all the reports I heard is that uh, you've really helped instill in students that they just can't be part of the problem. They have to be part of the solution. So you going into the schools uh, and doing these kind of programs where they have to take the initiative to, to participate uh, is very commendable. Yeah, and I have like, during the legislative session, I have five high school interns every single day. I, have, I noticed uh, that. Yeah, I have a, a, a student from Law, Farrington, and Radford in my office every afternoon. They come over after school and see the legislative process. Because I'm also a believer that, you know, in the past, when we look at leadership, it was like natural evolution. Somehow, the cream of the crop will rise, like you had, had from your days at Iolani to Harvard. But I believe also that we should be more strategic. We should kind of engineer leadership. And if we see a talented young middle school, high school student, don't let them just kind of by lucky, lucky strokes that they get into the right positions, but find them, nurture them, and then hopefully let them grow into a leadership capacity. Now let's talk about your role in your current capacity uh, as the chair of this very important committee. Uh, what have been some of your goals and objectives for this committee? I believe in having a robust economy. Uh, and if when, we, when the economy is good, we can solve our problems with education, homelessness, our roads. When the economy is bad, then we have to make some very hard decisions. But to me, what troubles our policy is that we don't pay enough attention to growing the economy. And uh, it's, it's a complicated issue, therefore it doesn't get the headlines, therefore it doesn't get as much community support. It's easier, right, when you see a homeless person at a tent at Thomas Square or in, uh, in the Kalihi area to talk about it. How do you build a vibrant economy? Because it's, it's not something you can actually touch, feel, and see. So it's harder to me to engage and energize the community about the importance of, an e of the economy. But I'm a big fan of how are we going to transition to an innovation economy? I believe that Hawaii's past was with uh, agriculture, tourism, it used this muscle. In the future, we're going to need this muscle. This muscle can only carry so much for a period of time. This muscle has uh, just unbelievable opportunities, and I'm a real fan of trying to push our economy to embrace innovative ways of uh, revitalizing even some of our old uh, uh, economic drivers. I mean, it, Agriculture can use technology. Tourism can use technology. So we're not going to say goodbye to some of our bedrock economic drivers, but I think we certainly should be thinking about how we're going to enhance them with technology. Are you concerned of this ongoing brain drain problem? Everyone seems to uh, characterize Hawaii's situation that many of our best and brightest uh, youth that uh, perhaps uh, should look at a career here are thinking, gee, if I want to make a dent, uh, if I want to live where it's affordable, if I want to have many more opportunities, I think I should think about going to the mainland as opposed to staying at home. Do you buy into that, or do you think it's, it's changing now? It's changing slowly. Um, I wish it was faster, but uh, we, you're absolutely right. We have to give the kids a reason to come home, and sometimes the service-oriented industries don't provide the pay scales that, that we need. The innovation economy, uh, an average uh, tech job in Hawaii is going to bring in 80. We have a, actually a plan. It's called the 8080 plan, where we're going to provide 80,000 new technology jobs with a minimum salary of $80,000 a year. At $80,000 a year, I think our kids would be willing to come, come home because those jobs are very hard to find uh, right out of college today, but the innovation economy can, can get us to, to that point. So before we can really get there, because there's been many ideas to diversify the economy through the years, many well-intentioned plans, but it always seems to come back to tourism. So tourism as it is now today, I think it's kind of easy for someone to kind of sit back and say, well, we're doing so well, why change? Uh, but in your mind, and I agree, we also need to provide other kinds of jobs. So let's talk about the challenges that face our tourism industry today and some of the bills uh, that have come before your committee uh, at the legislature and, and some of the issues that you see that we have to address sooner rather than later. 
uh, I think the big dog is Airbnb and the short-term vacation rentals. When you look at uh, what we have about 40,000 or so hotels throughout the state of Hawaii, 20 or 5,000 or so just in Waikiki, and we have any, anyone's estimate like up to 22,000 short-term vacation rentals, you see how these are a big chunk of the entire tourism uh, landscape. And right now, it's the wild, wild west for them. There is no rules for them. We're lucky if they even pay GET, but otherwise, they're in our neighborhoods. Uh, they bring uh, folks there, but they bring cars, they clog traffic uh, in, in, our, in our neighborhoods. Um, they're having kind of a negative impact. I mean, we had like 100 or so, okay, we can let, let them live, but we're at the plus 20,000 units of, of the short-term vacation rentals. We need to provide some type of guardrails around them. Guardrails on the taxation side, as well as guardrails on the land use and permitting side. And to this day, at least for Honolulu, we haven't figured that out yet. Now, why has it been so difficult for the legislature to wrap its arm around this? I mean, there's been, I think in the last three years, there's been several attempts, and we just can't seem to get the House and Senate to agree on a version, let alone get the governor to sign on to it. Why has it been so difficult? Uh, I think there's just different views and perspectives. I think the Senate's version is more aggressive uh, in in pr providing s clear parameters, reporting requirements, uh, audit requirements, uh, taking cases away from administrative hearings to, you're gonna go to court, you're gonna get uh, potentially penalties, perhaps jail time if you're a really bad actor. Um, the House doesn't see it in that way, doesn't wanna take quite that aggressive approach, a little bit more uh, hesitant because of potential lawsuits that might come, but I me, mean, that's why we have an attorney general to fight for Hawaii's uh, position on, on issues. But it, that's just a, the two schools of thought on the Senate uh, taking a very aggressive stance and the House taking kind of a, a shorter uh, step forward in trying to figure out how we corral the uh, short-term vacation. You know, some have suggested maybe the counties ought to be more proactive in this regard. They seem to also have hunted uh, the issue down the road and so forth. And Sitting County of Honolulu now has a major proposal that's been unveiled. Uh, and all the other neighbor island counties seem to be doing things at the county level to be kind of more aggressive. I guess the idea is maybe to send a message to the state that they're ready to participate, because in many of the discussions that we have had at the legislature, some legislators have said, you know, they really think the counties, because of the enforcement aspect and so forth, that they really should either be upfront on the issue or working side by side with the state going on. What are no, your thoughts? I totally agree. The, especially the land use side and the permitting side, that really should be a county issue. But absent the county doing anything for decades, that's why the state is kind of in this situation of trying to do what the counties should have been doing long ago. So you're right. I mean, we're putting the cart before the horse, but the public deserves better. And if the counties are not going to act and for whatever reason going to be paralyzed into doing nothing, then the state has to move forward. But you're absolutely right. The counties really should be taking care of the permitting side of this of this problem, and the state should really only be focusing on the tax collection side, the GET and the TAT, from, uh, that's the hotel room occupancy tax, as well as the general excise tax for these individuals who are making oodles and oodles of money uh, and not paying their fair share. Yeah. yeah, and Senator, you know, while we're talking about this, I also want to make it real clear, at least from where Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association is at, you know, we're not out to eliminate Airbnbs and other type of platforms that regard. We just want to see a level playing field. Uh, where there's transparency, accountability. If we're paying GET, if we're paying TET, we would like for them to pay the same. And I think also to be mindful of the fact that communities are being impacted. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be construed as a hotel versus Airbnb. It's more Airbnb versus the community because many community folks are saying they cannot afford to live where they want to live now. They have to look elsewhere. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. Because I'm a fan, when we grow the economy, it's not about digging deeper into people's pockets, it's creating more pockets. And here's a situation where there's plenty of pockets out there that should be paying their fair share. But it, absent that, what did we do last year? We dug deeper into your pockets. We added a GET, a 1% increase to the GET to pay for rail. Think if we had all of these unpaying pockets, so to speak, if we could get them to pay in, we would never have had to touch the GET, or excuse me, the TAT on hotels and perhaps wouldn't have had to extend the GET for the greater public if we had this pot of money that should, should be uh, paying into the state coffers. We're talking uh, with Senator Glenn Wakai here on a new show that uh, we have debuted called Tourism 101. We 
We're going to take a quick pause for the card. We come back. We're going to talk about other issues that face the legislature with respect to our number one industry, tourism. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us, and the world. My name is Reg Baker and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii. We broadcast every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 and we highlight successful businesses in Hawaii. Hawaii has some challenges, most places do, but we have businesses here that have figured out how to make it work and we learn their secrets and we learn how they have made it successfully in Hawaii. Occasionally we'll have organizations that come on and explain how they help these businesses to be successful. Uh, and we find that there's an awful lot of resources out there available to anybody in business to help them do better. So please tune in every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 here at the Think Tech Studios and get educated. Hello, everyone. We're here on uh, Tourism 101 with our guest, Senator Glenn Wakai having a very interesting conversation about tourism. You know, everybody in Hawaii has an idea about tourism. You don't have to work in the industry because it affects all of us. Either you're working in the industry or you know someone in your family mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, is related to the tourism industry. And I think uh, a question I'm going to ask you next that everyone has an opinion on is the state of our airports. Oh, <laughs> that's a sore <laughs> point for the state. You know, our, our mutual friend, uh, Jerry Tan, who comes from Saipan and Guam to visit us every once in a while. You know, so one thing that he always says is his impression about Hawaii is that, you know, your airports, you know, I travel all over, and for a major city like yours, you know, why is there, is there problems, and how come you folks can't resolve the issue? And we talk about the bill that's before the legislature and some of the challenges, and that bill, too, uh, has not moved forward to where we'd like it to be. Can you share your thoughts on that? First of all, the airport is so embarrassing, I mean, to get out of the plane, you pay thousands of dollars, here's your dream vacation, the toilets don't work, the lighting is dark, the wiki wiki shuttle is cramped, and the people mover doesn't work. And if you're coming in from a foreign country, you have a 45 to an hour wait at immigration. What a terrible experience for them to, to come in on. And when they leave, they see the same ugly rundown airport when they, they leave. What a terrible way to welcome them and say goodbye to, to them. But we're in this situation because of just government inertia. Uh, we're doing the same things over and over and getting the same junk results. So for the past three years, we at the legislature have been trying to create what's called an airport authority, bringing the private sector in to help government where it can't figure out how to come up with a solution. And sorry to say to the public that for the second year in a row, this idea failed miserably. But I think the public deserves better. The public deserves to have an airport well-planned, making sure that the quarters actually meet up would be nice. Um, some basic fundamental construction flaws uh, that lead then to grievances, that then lead to lawsuits. We, we, we got to stop all of this uh, wasteful spending and waste time. We got to get a first-class airport for our first-class tourism industry and having, I think, an airport corporation where you have smart public sector, uh, private sector minds coming in to help the public sector, the airports division, figure out how to build out a very efficient airport. That's what's needed because we can't continue with the same old, same old approach. You know, and I want to make it clear too, it's not just for Daniel K. Inouye International Airport. We're talking about all the airports throughout the state of Hawaii. Yes, um, the Kona Airport kind of is junk too. Maui's one is okay. Kauai's one is a little bit better, but still, yeah, throughout. But in fact, I think the I was at Maui, and they have like really nice bathrooms. It's kind of sad that we think like, wow, and uh, that should be like a, a given, right? That airport bathrooms should be clean and work. But the fact that I point out that Maui has nice, big, clean airport bathrooms that work is kind of a shameful uh, commentary about Honolulu's airport here. Yeah. 
And certainly this is not to disparage the hardworking employees at the airport, but certainly I think the whole idea behind this, we want to be able to have them work in a more efficient way uh, and to be able to have the operation as such, uh, where the Department of Transportation is such a big department. And I think to Ford Fujikami's credit, when he was at the director, he was okay with saying, you know what, take the airport out of the DOT. We've got roads and highways and ports and, uh, and the harbors to worry about. And perhaps with a laser-like focus coming uh, from the uh, airport uh, corporation or airport authority, uh, it'll get us better results. Right. And the public, most of the public probably doesn't know that they don't, as taxpayers, they don't pay for the airport. It's all user fees, airlines, concessions. So to me, you have a ripe situation where, you know, you don't have to come to the legislature and politics gets involved. But the airport can be kind of a standalone entity and figure out what its future is going to be. So uh, you're, 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 you're correct in that they, more so than other government entities, can be kind of just jettisoned off to function uh, more autonomously. And we've seen this uh, notion work in other cities uh, and, and states throughout America. Yeah, I think Hawaii's one of only two states that Six. don't have an uh, airport authority. Yeah. Now let, let's move into another uh, question uh, on another uh, state facility that's right in your district. In fact, you said your district goes from Kali to Aloha Stadium. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Aloha Stadium and, and what you see as uh, what we need to do to move forward. People have talked about building a new stadium. Uh, this one here is in need of major renovations if we're going to attract more exciting initiatives uh, and events and the like we need to do something with the stadium so what are your thoughts on that I think it's a golden opportunity you have a hundred acres in a suburban piece of, of, of uh, Hawaii and it shouldn't be just a standalone stadium right we have a lot same and you have all the parking lot around it we need to create something super cool and dynamic and one thing I, I am frustrated with are the small thinkers that we have 100 acres and maybe the conversation will start with affordable housing. Now, affordable housing is important, but it's not exciting. I mean, I want to help push something that's dynamic there. Uh, how about an amusement park? How about like uh, restaurants? How about retail? I was talking to AEG just yesterday. They have created, if you're familiar with Los Angeles outside the Staples Center, is LA Live, where you have restaurants, theaters, you have uh, bars, you have museums, you have, you have lots of of inviting action there. We got to embrace that idea of having a stadium that is surrounded by opportunities for housing, for entertainment. And what we also forget is that the number two tourist attraction in Hawaii is right next door, Pearl Harbor. 1.8 million of our 10 million or so visitors go to Pearl Harbor. And what do they do? They get from Waikiki, they get on the bus, see the memorial, get on the bus, and they dig out. We have nothing to I mean, we have a ready-made audience there. We created a promenade that connected the Arizona Memorial to this Aloha Stadium walk uh, area that's going to be revitalized. Boy, we have a golden opportunity. Plus, the rail stop is there. I mean, we can't have the rail stop be a parking ride and people get, go there for six UH football games and otherwise the other rest of the year is not utilized. We've got to create that place as a destination. And I think there's huge, huge opportunities for us to build a new stadium, but more excitingly, put some type of uh, development, mixed-use development around the stadium. Now, some have suggested that uh, maybe the stadium should be moved elsewhere no. and relocated. What are your thoughts on that? No way. Uh, because if you think about most areas, traffic is the number one thing. Right? Oh, are you going to bring 50,000 or 40,000 people here? We don't like the traffic. In that area, if you think about it, um, well, there's some problems sometimes with the Pro Bowl and getting in, but no one has a problem leaving. We've got to get the coming in part figured out. But there's, there's an H3, you got a kind of juxtaposition between Hawaii Kai and Waianae. So to me, the, the location is ideal. You put this thing out in Kapolei, I don't know if the people in Hawaii Kai or Kaneohe are going to feel compelled to go buy tickets for UH football or Bruno Mars or whatever attraction might be coming here. I think Aloha Stadium is the ideal location and we should really focus on how to make that uh, a center point for entertainment in Hawaii. Now, you and others at the legislature have had some serious concerns about the Hawaii Tourism Authority. And yes, uh, the tourism increases to our islands have gone up in the last six years and the like. So some might be thinking, you know, why, why is Senator Wakai and others concerned and, and an audit that had come out that you folks raised questions about? So could you clarify your position on this? I think we're seeing record numbers of tourists because of 
currency issues, worldwide um, issues, natural disasters, terrorist things. Hawaii is a safe uh, destination, and Hawaii Tourism Authority should be helping to enhance that image and, and branding. But if the Hawaii Tourism Authority were to disappear tomorrow, we're not going to go to zero tourists uh, in, the, in the future. But it, it's concerning to me because the Hawaii Tourism Authority is a public funded agency. And whether tourism is going gangbusters or not so good, they have an obligation to, to utilize the public funds to the best of their ability. And an audit that came out in February of this year was an indictment on everything that they're doing there, not everything, but uh, on a number of their processes there that they're paying for uh, services that never got invoices. They're doing business with, with entities that aren't even registered to do business in Hawaii. You know, just the, the basics need to be uh, assured. And so what you saw and what the public saw this past legislative session was us trying to like rein them in to say that, you know, there's, there, you, there are rules that you need to abide by. You haven't been. And therefore, we held their feet to the fire. Because oftentimes we get audits, oha, skating. What happened after that? Nothing. Uh, so I was going to, I took that audit. I said, can it just be nothing? Like, okay, put that on the shelf and hope, cross our fingers and hope that something better happens in the next five years. Like, no, this audit told us, a, gave us a lot of direction as to the pain points there. And I took it upon myself with my colleagues uh, to say, no, we're going to fix this uh, machine that's kind of gotten sideways uh, and, uh, and make sure that the public funds are being utilized properly. So very quick question. Uh, are we at the point now where we have to really reassess in the, in, in the minute that we have left here? And I know it's a very complicated issue. But are we at the point where we as a community have to address the question of uh, have we reached the tipping point of having too many tourists coming here uh, because of the success of the last six years? So we should kind of maybe take a step back and reassess where we are uh, to make sure that it's not just a great place to visit, but for our residents. Well, oh, you're absolutely correct. I mean, I think we're going to take the foot off the gas just a little bit and focus more on management and less emphasis on, on marketing because you're, you're right. There's been some community pushback, uh, bit local uh, uh, impressions of tourism has never been lower than it is today. We have to right that ship so that we have a vibrant economic driver in tourism, but that the people of Hawaii, and the local people of Hawaii, embrace it as well. Well. Senator Wakai, thank you very much. I mean, oh, we could pleasure. go on and on and on. Seems like half hour I'll be with back you. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, we want to thank our guest today, Senator Glenn Wakai. As you can see, has lots of ideas, uh, and certainly he's hard at work uh, to ensure that this industry continues to move forward and provides a great quality of life for all of us. And uh, we wish you well. Uh, session is coming up uh, in, in a few months, and you may be even going into a, a special session soon in, in October. Yes. Uh, to uh, appoint some judges or confirm some judges, I should say. Yep. Yeah, so that uh, should get him in, into action there, but it's going to be a very limited agenda, if you will, just uh, on the judiciary appointments and the like. So thank you again, uh, folks, for tuning in today. Uh, and I want to thank our guest today, Senator Glenn Wakai, for being on oh. our very first show. Thank you. Thank you for getting us off to a great start. Oh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Aloha, and see you next time. Aloha.